So let us begin our morning worship. everybody would you please join me in our call to worship we gather to respond to the call of God's love thankful that someone cared enough to share this good news with us may we be compassionate enough to share this divine presence with others love we share is not divided but multiplied love given away is not diminished but expanded May our gathering beckon and welcome those near and far to know the love of this divine presence. From deep within us, we know of a loving presence. All around us, we see glory, beauty, life, and light. We have no words for what we experience, so we cry out, God! In this moment of worship, may that loving presence grow deeper. May our awareness of the divine presence around us grow more intense. May we gather in this place, learn to pay more attention to God who loves us at all times and in all places. Please join me in our prayer of invocation and the Lord's Prayer. God of love and life, in this moment of prayer, be more and more in us that we might live more and more in you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. This we pray to you in the name of Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 62, verses 5 through 12, and I'll be reading from the message. God, the one and only, I'll wait as long as he says. Everything I hope for comes from him, so why not? He's solid rock under my feet, breathing room for my soul, an impregnable castle I'm set for life. My help and glory are in God, granite strength and safe harbor God. So trust him absolutely, people. Lay your lives on the line for him. God is a safe place to be. Man is such a smoke. Woman is such a mirage. Put them together, they're nothing. Two times nothing is nothing. And a windfall, if it comes, don't make too much of it. God said this once and for all. How many times have I heard it repeated? Strength comes straight from God. Love to you, Lord God. You pay a fair wage for a good day's work. Amen. Our first hymn this morning comes from a hymn out of the New Century Hymnal. If you should know the tune and want to sing along, please do. I'm going to read the words as Grace plays this morning. Thank you. 
gifts on us bestow. With delight, our souls are nourished. Pleasure leads us where we go. At God's hand does love stand. Joy awaits each new command. In glad hymns to God eternal, sacrifice a praise be done. High above all praises praising for the love in Christ made known. Hear Christ call one and all. Those who follow shall not fall. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20, and I'm reading from the NIV. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. And when they had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed Jesus. Our message for the young at heart today is called Follow the Leader. In the movie, Peter Pan, there is a place where the children are playing a, call, a game called Follow the Leader and singing these words, following the leader, the leader, the leader. We're following the leader wherever he may go. Now, I remember playing this game as a young child, and my parents and aunts and uncles remembered playing this game when they were kids, and so did my grandparents. Follow the leader is a game that is played and enjoyed by children all over this world. That's probably because the rules are very simple. You choose a leader, and you follow him wherever he goes and you do whatever he does. So you stomp through puddles, you climb over fences, you get in the hayloft, you swing from a tree, all to stay in the game because nobody really wants to be a quitter or a loser. Follow the leader is a great game, but in our daily lives, we play follow the leader too. In school, in church, in sports, at work, in any activity we engage in, there are always leaders. Every day we're faced with making a choice about which leader we're going to follow. We must be sure to choose a leader that will lead us in the right direction. Now, we just heard in the gospel reading that one day Jesus was walking along the seashore when he saw two fishermen, Peter and Andrew who were throwing their fishing nets out into the sea. But Jesus called out to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It also tells us that they willingly laid down their nets and followed him immediately. Then Jesus went a little farther along and he saw two more men, James and John, sitting in their boat, mending their fishing nets. And Jesus called out to them too. And it tells us that they also left their boat and willingly followed Jesus. None of them really knew what they would be called to do. Fish for people? What? And yet, as uncertain as this was for them, they didn't hesitate. They followed Jesus, the leader. Now, Jesus is still calling people to follow him today. He calls some to go to foreign countries to fish for people. We call them missionaries. He has called you and me to follow him. 
Now it's us, up to us to decide if we will follow the leader. Since I decided to follow Jesus, I don't always know where he's calling me to or what he is calling me to do, but I still continue to follow him as my leader. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, you have called us to follow you. May we, like Peter, Andrew, James, and John say, yes, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you may lead. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is very familiar to most of us. Jesus calls us for the tumult. <laughs> demonstration that a blessing or benefit has been received. We heard a call, dropped our nets, and came to this place to find new life. The gifts we give today are but tokens of the blessings of a new life we live in Christ. Bring and give your gifts with joy, for they remind us of just how blessed we are to know this love that flows so generously from the Spirit of God. Please join me in our unison prayer of dedication. May these gifts given to these ministries of grace be a blessing to friends and strangers, those like us and those not, those deserving and those not. For in this way, the love of God reaches all of God's beloved. Amen. The scripture lesson this morning for our pastoral message is from the book of Jonah. And I'm reading from chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. I'm reading from the NIV, but whatever Bible you may have in front of you, you might want to turn to Jonah. It's uh, right after the prophet Amos. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on their sackcloth. The king of Nineveh proclaimed, let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. 
When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and he did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. This morning, we continue the message of call, God's call on our lives, Jesus's call on our hearts. Come and follow me. I love the book of Jonah. It's a very short book, but right from the very first verse, it declares Jonah's purpose, his mission, what he's supposed to be doing. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. It's pretty clear. Not much room for doubt or misunderstanding. And yet, by the third verse, just one verse later in this first chapter, we know that Jonah did not follow the call. Jonah did not follow the leader. In fact, what we're told is that Jonah ran away from the Lord. He boarded a ship and he headed for Tarshish. What's up? Did he not hear God's instructions clearly or at all? Was he just being a stubborn person who said to himself, I think I would like the city of Tarshish way better than Nineveh. So I'll head that direction. It'll be more fun. No, it is clearly an act of disobedience. For the scripture says, Jonah ran away from the Lord. He had no intention of following the leader. Now we all know that when we make bad choices, turn ourselves away from what we know to be right, journey down those pathways filled with darkness and obstacles in the way that there most likely are going to be consequences, sometimes dire consequences. And that's exactly what happens to Jonah. So he's on the ship and a great wind arose and caused this violent storm so severe that the very structure of the ship was being threatened. All on board were afraid, crying out to their own gods while throwing cargo off the ship to lighten its load. Everyone that is except Jonah. Where was Jonah? Well, he was down below deck taking a sound nap, oblivious to the situation at hand, until the captain decided to wake him and begged him to please call on his God as well. Maybe your God will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors decided to cast lots to see who was responsible for this disaster. See, it was common in those days to cast lots to see which God's will was superior to the other gods. And so they decided it was time to get to know this passenger, this stranger whom they had allowed to join their ship ride. Tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? What, what people are you from? Often when we don't understand what's happening around us, or we don't wanna take responsibility for our own choices, it's easy to seek the cause of our woes and place blame somewhere else. We're told that Jonah explained that he was a Hebrew and his God was the very God of all creation. And this terrified them even more. Now they must have heard about this God in their travels from others, but they appear to understand this God's power. And they ask, Jonah, what have you done? As the seas got rougher and rougher, they understood this to be the power of Jonah's God. What should we do? 
What should we do to, to you in order for the calm of the sea so that God's wrath will not be against us as it is for you? So Jonah comes up with a great idea. Why don't you just throw me overboard just as you did all of your cargo? But they feel mercy towards Jonah and they attempt to row towards shore, but it becomes clear that that's gonna be impossible as the seas grow even wilder and wilder. And they understood that the only way to calm the sea was to do as Jonah had told them. And so with hesitation, they tossed Jonah overboard and they called upon Jonah's God, please Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you Lord have done as you pleased. Now see, they had not only heard of this powerful God, they witnessed him firsthand. And we're told they feared the Lord. When the Bible refers, refers to fear of the Lord, it means having a deep respect, a reverence and awe for God's power and authority. Rather than causing someone to be afraid of God, a proper fear of the Lord leads one to love God. Now that could have been the end of the story. The ship could have made its way to Tarshish as it had planned and unloaded what cargo it had left and recovered their losses and moved on. But that's not where God chose to lead the story. Jonah ran from God and through his actions, others came to believe in God. But that isn't the end, is it? God didn't let Jonah drown and die as one would naturally think. But instead, he sent a great fish to swallow him up and provide shelter for Jonah. For three days and three nights, Jonah was in the belly of that fish. And we're told that he prayed to the Lord his God without ceasing. A prayer of distress, of repentance of renewed covenant to God. I encourage you to go to chapter two in Jonah and read this prayer. It most likely will resonate with you as it should. For all of us have prayed at one time or another in our lives, a similar prayer, it's called an emergency prayer. We often pray emergency prayers as a result of our own decisions and poor choices. And in God's great mercy, the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah out onto the dry land. The last two lines of Jonah's prayer is this. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Now don't rush on to chapter three just yet. Take a moment and symbolize the symbol, or savor the symbolism here. Jonah is thrown into the depths of the ocean. Jesus is thrown to the persecution of the Romans and nailed to a cross. Three days and three nights, Jonah prays incessantly in the belly of a fish. And three days and nights, Jesus lay in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Jonah was released on land. Jesus resurrected from the cross. Salvation comes from the Lord. Okay, now you can move on to chapter three. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. This time Jonah did exactly as God instructed him to do. 
He delivered the message, proclaiming what the Lord had sent him to proclaim. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Why not 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 for that matter? Why 40 days? Because the Lord again has a message here. We're getting close to Lent. 40 days of repentance, 40 days to get our hearts in the right place so that we can present ourselves truthfully before the Lord. Now, I'm sure that during that 40 day time, Jonah had plenty of time to share his story with all who would listen to him. And most likely, it was Jonah's testimony that brought the Ninevites to turn from their ways and to believe in the one true God. People out there aren't going to just listen to our words. They are going to listen to our stories of how this God, our God, works in our everyday lives and the miracles that we have witnessed firsthand. They're going to watch us, for the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. And when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. Not only are others watching us, but so is God. And when we turn to God with repentant hearts, with willing hearts, ready to take action for God, we are shown mercy and are showered and bathed by God's love and grace, as undeserved as that may be. Paul tells us in our reading today that we cannot depend upon what we what you believe to be true or fact, upon what has been and what we have relied upon. For these things will not be there when we look for them. In fact, he says, for the present form of this world is passing away. Jesus claims, the time is fulfilled. Now is the time. The promises of the past are now standing here before you. Follow me. No doubts, no looking back, no resentments, no questioning. Do it, for only here will you find true life and prosperity and security. Only here will you find your purpose and meaning for your life. Only here. Here. Jonah got a second chance to respond to God's call. And many of us have that opportunity for coming through the call of Jesus on our lives as well. But we are also reminded this will not always be so. Jesus will come back. But when is the question? Mark tells us no one knows the exact time when Jesus is coming again. But that, about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Jesus is patiently waiting to come back because he is giving humanity as much time as possible to choose to follow him. Jesus wants as many people as possible to repent and return to heaven with him. Peter says, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. 
And so Jonah set out and he went according to the word of the Lord to proclaim the message that the God, gods had given him. May that be so for each of us. We might not always be happy about it. We might cop a resentment or hide a little anger in the deep recess of our soul, just like Jonah did. I'll let you read chapter four of Jonah yourself. But you know what? The bottom line is God will come to us as many times as there is time. The problem is, the longer we wait, the less time there is. And we might, in fact, miss out on that time. The word of the Lord came. Will you go out according to the word of the Lord? Let us pray. Father God, your love abounds and your safe protection surrounds us. It matters not if we come into this sanctuary to gather together or we pull ourselves collectively together on Zoom or if we're alone in the quiet of our own homes. For you are observing our worship from wherever you are, wherever we are. You hear our songs, you listen to our prayers, you discern say, the state of our souls from afar. What a wonderful thing it is to know that we can come to you directly, wherever we are, because of the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, the true king, the true priest, the true leader. Holy One, what a blessing and privilege we share here in your sacred space. But like Jonah, we sometimes are jealous of what we share here. We know that others are longing and thirsting for what we know and experience in you, but we wanna keep this for ourselves to claim it as our very own. So Lord, forgive us our reluctance to open our doors and let others in, to open our hearts to others, some like us, some not. We repent of our hesitations and unwillingness to witness to those that we have considered strangers and even enemies for fear they just might belong here among us. Lord Jesus, you are the one who calls us to this place, calls us to reconciliation through grace. You are the one who will not deny a repentant heart or an open spirit. You are the one who assures us that we are forgiven and walk in the new way that is made known to us in God's love. Holy Spirit, gift us with the blessing of open hearts, open minds, open arms. This I pray to you for your people. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning, the master has come and he calls us, is filled with wonderful lyrics. I hope that as you sing, you will think of the words before you. And if you just read it while we sing, take time to look at the words in front of you.
Now may the one who is faithful to all be with us all as we depart this blessed space. May we be a blessing to every place we go, to every person we encounter, until we gather again. Amen. Indeed, keep coming back. Thank you for worshiping with us today. God bless and have a great week.